Good morning and welcome to the social justice webinar series. My name is Charmaine Ward Milner and I lead the corporate relations team across the state. I'm also the chair of the social justice initiative for Georgia Power. So before we get started, I want to do a safety briefing, which is what we always do before we start a meeting. So if you are in your office um, or if you're in one of our Georgia Power buildings, you probably know where the exit signs are. But please just look around, look to your right, look to your left and front and look behind and make sure you know where the exits are and how to get out the building. Now, if you're at home, one of the things I want to make sure that you know also is where the exits are, but you're probably familiar with that. But look on the floor and make sure that you don't have any drawers sticking out or any folders or books sitting on the floor or any obstacles that could be in your way when you try to exit. Also, make sure you're not cooking. What we found is a lot of people are trying to multitask, so make sure there's nothing on the nothing in the oven, there's nothing on the cooktop. Go ahead and turn those things off. We want to make sure that everyone is safe. So with that, so excited that you have joined us for the fifth of our six social justice webinars. And so today it is energy justice. And what I'd like to do is just spend a little bit of time just level setting and providing you with an overview of the social justice initiative. So it all starts with the moving to equity. Now, this was announced back in January of 2020 by Tom Fanning, CEO of Southern Company, and it was to address some of the social injustices that we had all seen and heard during those times, right? So moving to equity, and you see it on the screen, is also referred to as MTE. And so this is really looking at all of our business policies, our business practices, how we make decisions to ensure that there is equity in the five critical areas that we use to run our business. And that's talent, culture, community, political engagement, and suppliers. And so again, it's looking at all those practices. So I'll give you one example of something that's been done recently, and that's in the talent commitment. And that is now that in the... Um, interview process and the, and the job hiring process, we are redacting the resumes. And what that means is that we're taking resumes and we're taking everything off that might tell a person's race or gender or age or anything like that. And we're really just trying to show on that resume the skills, competencies, the experiences. And so it's not until later in the process that the manager would actually get to see all of that other information. And so this is a way in our hiring practices of making sure that there is more equity. And so we're doing things like that in each of these areas, looking at the policies and the procedures, again, to ensure we have equity in these critical areas. Now, the second thing is that I want you to focus on community. So underneath the community commitment, you can see that this is where the social justice initiative lies. And this is the commitment of $225 million over five years to advance racial equity and social justice. And we're going to do this by investing in distressed and disadvantaged communities. And so that's what we're talking about today is the social justice initiative. So this is part of the community commitment. So now let's look at the social justice. And so with social justice, there are four pillars. Now, when we initially started, there were three pillars. I just want to spend a few moments on this. These four pillars, education equity, criminal justice equity, economic empowerment, and energy and justice and energy justice are not by happenstance. So last year, there was a cross system committee that was put together. So people from all different opcos and I very excited that I was part of that committee. And we got together to determine where are the biggest disparities? Where are the biggest gaps? We talked to other nonprofits. We talked to other corporations. We looked at best practices. We looked at all kinds of data. And then we said, now that we understand those gaps and disparities, where can the resources this Southern company has make the biggest impact? And so that's how we came up with the social justice pillars. Now, I started out with three pillars, and just recently in the last couple of months, we added the energy justice pillar. So when we think about investments, when we think about volunteering and employee engagement, we're talking about these specific areas as it relates to social justice. And so I want to just take you through very quickly at a high level each of the pillars. So we look at education equity. 
we're talking about the entire continuum. So starting with early childhood, we want to invest in those organizations that help with language acquisition. With K through 12, specifically around reading and math and STEAM. We also want to focus on investing in higher education, specifically HBCUs and PWIs, which are primarily white institutions that have a large, um, a large group of minority students, a large population of minority students, I should say. Um, and so those are all areas that we want to invest in um, around education equity. When we look at criminal justice equity, again, it is going from the beginning to the end. We want to be very comprehensive in terms of our investment. And so we want to invest in organizations that provide programs before people even get into trouble. So how can we invest in youth prevention programs so that they know that there are other ways that they can, other ways that they can um, proceed, that there are other initiatives and things that they can do so that they don't even get to prevention. Um, the other thing is we want to invest in, in, in programs that will focus on pre-arrest and diversion. So you may not know that when a person gets pulled over, a policeman can determine whether they send them to jail or whether they send them to a pre-arrest program. So we want to invest in those programs and then we want to invest in re-entry programs. And so that is once individuals are incarcerated and they do their time, they pay their dues and they come back into um, society, that they have the resources that they need, both training and wraparound sources so that we so that they can come back into the community and be thriving citizens. We also want to invest in those programs that help to educate the responders so that they know how to de-escalate and that they know about these various programs. When we go to economic empowerment pillar, this is really a big pillar. It's really focused on two different things. One is entrepreneurship and the other is investment in our communities, specifically having thriving communities. So we think when you talk about entrepreneurship, we're talking about investing in those organizations that help entrepreneurs build capacity, have access to capital, understand financial literacy and budget, budgeting, understand how um, they can do have more efficient processes in their companies, investing in organizations that will really help these entrepreneurs so they can take it to the next level. And when we're talking about community investment, we're talking about investing in those organizations around affordable housing, infrastructure, those things that will create thriving communities. And then let's go over to energy justice. So energy justice, here the first thing we're talking about is really investing in those organizations that are addressing energy burden. And that's where an individual has a significant amount of their salary that they are paying for energy. We also want to help organizations that are they're focusing on energy assistance. So think about our Salvation Army Project Share. That's a perfect example. Investing in other organizations like that. And then finally, giving these disadvantaged and distressed communities access to energy efficiency programs and weatherization programs. We want to make sure that all communities have access. We move to just transition. It's very much the same thing. So we want to make sure that we're focused on e-transportation and having access to electric cars and to charging stations. What good does it do to have an electric car if you can't get to a charging station? So making sure that those are in all communities across the state and that communities have access to renewables, whether it's solar or air or, or hydro. And then making sure that we're focused on investing in those organizations that provide job training around sustainability. And then the final thing is environmental justice, and that is really looking at those communities that might be impacted because they're a fence line, which means they are next to one of our assets. And that could be a headquarters, a substation, a generation plant, or those communities that are frontline, meaning they're right in the area of critical weather and they're constantly getting hit with critical weather. So we wanna make sure um, that we are investing in organizations that support these communities. So when we're talking about investing in social justice, this is what we're talking about. And we know that if we invest in these very specific areas, and a lot of people say, well, gosh, it's so specific. Correct, it is intentional. What we know is that the shotgun approach does not work. We need to be intentional and invest those dollars very in, in a, a very um, focused way so that we can begin to really change the trajectory. And we think we can. So let's go to the next slide. So what are we investing? 
So from a Georgia Power perspective, well, you may remember I talked about 225 million from Southern Company, and that also includes an engagement of our employees. So from a Southern Company perspective, we've also committed to 5,000 employee mentors. And so because what the reason we've done that is it's not just cash, we also want to engage people. And so it's important that we do both. And so when we look back at Georgia Power and say, well, what does that mean to us? So it's 87 million over five years. And you can see on the slide how that money is allocated um, for each of those pillars. And then per year is $18 million. Now, I know I have some math majors out there that are saying, wait a minute, Charmaine, that doesn't add up. You're right. And that's because we just added the energy justice pillar, and we won't begin investing in that pillar until 2022. And so for us, the GPC employee mentors is 250 mentors a year. And we know that our employees are already volunteering. They're already mentoring. So we are confident that we are going to exceed this number. So now the last thing, I've talked a lot about MTE moving to equity. I've talked about the social justice initiative. Next slide, please. Um, and then what I wanna do is talk about DE&I and how all of these things fit together. We often are asked, wait a minute, I'm confused. This I hope will kind of explain it. Now it's a very simplified slide. It's very, um, you know, a simplified definition, but think of moving to equity as an overarching framework in terms of how we're going to address racial um, inequities and how we're going to address social justice. And now when you look at the social justice initiative, these are our external initiatives for how we will advance racial equity, right? And then DE&I is internally focused. So that is how as employees, we interact with each other. We celebrate our differences. We make sure that we are being inclusive. So if you think about it, DE&I is the internal and social justice is the external. Now, there are some places where that blurs, but this is, again, a simplified way of just beginning to think about it. And both of these things fall under moving to equity. So with that, um, I hope that this has really provided just a really quick and um, easy overview of our social justice initiative. But I'd like now to just show you a video by Chris Womack, our CEO, who really talks about it even better than I do. So can we play the video? At Georgia Power, we believe it's our responsibility to be an active champion of the communities we serve. That's why we're excited to stand with our communities to tackle systemic equity issues across our state. We're committing $87 million to address these issues over the next five years, focusing on supporting and partnering with organizations that assist with education equity, criminal justice, energy justice, and economic empowerment. And we're building a team of more than 250 employees who will serve as mentors to our state's young people, helping shape Georgia's future leaders. This financial investment and our commitment to mentoring, while just a part of our overall equity efforts, are one way we can make a real impact in distressed and disadvantaged communities and continue to be a champion for all Georgians. Thank you, Chris. That was great. So I know that you guys really, um, appreciated, you know, his perspective on why we're doing it and how important this social justice initiative is. At this time, I have the honor of introducing our, our awesome moderator, who is Jeff Smith. And Jeff is the Energy Efficiency Strategy Manager. And then he is going to introduce this amazing panel of subject matter experts that we have today and just sit back because we really have um, a lot of good information and insight that we want to share with you. Jeff, it is all yours. And, and to echo what you said, we do have an amazing uh, group of panelists, so I will keep my comments brief uh, and go on to the experts in this field. And uh, But before we do that, I just wanted to quickly uh, address three things, uh, the first of which is just an overview or a definition of what is energy justice, and that'll just help frame uh, what we're talking about for the rest of this discussion. Uh, and, and the basic definition of it is, it's the goal of achieving equity in both social and economic delivery of energy matters, while also remediating decades long social, economic and health burdens of those customers that are disproportionately disadvantaged. 
So as we think about that in our community and in, in Georgia Power's territory, uh, communities of color, co communities of color often bear the brunt of these social problems. Um, higher utility bills, air quality and health issues that go along with it and increased vulnerability to natural disasters. So as Georgia Power, along with the experts that we have on today's discussions, we're committed, as you've seen through Charmaine's discussion, to, to helping solve energy justice. And hopefully after this discussion, uh, you will be motivated to do the same. So the next thing we wanna kind of quickly talk through is what are the challenges with energy justice? And if you look at the, the left side of the slide and those boxes, you'll see that it is a broad reaching topic uh, and it has a variety of, of, of issues and things that lie within it. And, and the start of that really is energy equity. Uh, in, in some areas you'll hear it referred to as energy burden. You may hear both of those terms on and off today. But essentially, energy equity is very common for those that are in the most need to pay a disproportionately high percentage of their income towards their energy bills and their energy cost. Uh, so energy equity is at the heart of, of energy justice. The next thing you'll see there highlighted is just transition. And think about where we are in the world today with the uh, growing uh, electric transportation market that we have. We're starting to see just a, a strong growth in renewable energy, battery storage, advanced energy efficiency, and all customers should be able to take advantage of those, not just those that are at or above marginal or average income. And also in that just transition space, there's a workforce that's needed to, to develop and grow this infrastructure. And these are technical high paying jobs and there's opportunities in, in these communities that we're highlighting to train those folks to do some of this work and to help relieve their energy burden and their economic situation. So that's part of what we will be talking through today. Another challenge in the energy justice space is communities uh, that are below the average median income in the state are also those same communities that suffer some of the environmental impacts that that uh, Charmaine talked about earlier. And in many cases, those are communities of color and they don't have some of the resources to improve the situation in that space. And then, you know, lastly, some of the, the challenges that we'll talk about are policies and policies are also very broad reaching. They can be federal, state, and at local levels, and those are not necessarily things that that move or get adopted quickly. So those can be some of the challenges with energy justice that we'll be talking through and trying to identify ways to overcome that. And, and the last thing I'll say before we kick it over to our panel of experts and, and have a, a more broader discussion is that last bullet there. How does energy justice connect to our business? How does it connect to Georgia Power? Well, first and foremost, electricity, like other energy sources, is, is a primary need for all customers, and we deliver that. So it's obviously a direct tie to our business in that space. When we think about the state of Georgia as a whole, it has a high number of citizens throughout the state that suffer from energy burden. So just a little more formal definition of energy burden is that's customers that have 6% or more of their income goes towards their energy bills. And those disproportionately high costs um, are a way that we can start looking at, at how does Georgia power and how do we work with our customers through that space. And, and these customers, as we think through them, they're our family, they're our friends, you know, they're our coworkers, they're people that we work with in our communities and we interact with on a daily basis and making sure that we have a way to help remove these obstacles and improve their quality of life is essential to us and our company. And lastly, Georgia, with Georgia Power, whereas we're an energy company, we're also energy partners to our customers and it's, all, it's on us, it's a part of what we do to help make sure all of our customers have affordable and reliable energy. Uh, and so as we move through this discussion over the next several minutes, that's the lens that we're looking at this through. Um, so just wanted to kind of quickly highlight that. And now we'll move into introdu introducing the stars of our show today. Uh, so as I ask each one of you, if you would just quickly uh, talk about who you are, what, who you work for, and any other pertinent information you want to share as we get through this. So Cyrus, you want to go first? Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, before I introduce myself, I want to say a, a few words of thanks 
uh, first to Jeff and the team uh, for considering us uh, part of this group, part of this panel. Uh, it's good to see uh, a few colleagues that I haven't seen in quite a while because of the pandemic, uh, and it's good to meet some new ones as well. I also want to acknowledge Jeff has been a long serving member of uh, the Southeast Energy Efficiency Alliance board, and we are grateful for his service. Um, I want to acknowledge Chris Womack, uh, Georgia Power CEO, who I've had the good fortune to meet through uh, Southern Companies um, stakeholder meetings that they hold on an annual basis. Um, it's a rare treat uh, to meet the leading executives of the utilities that work in our region and Southern uh, has been uh, outstanding in creating those opportunities. Uh, and I can see uh, Chris's influence all over these initiatives. So it's 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 uh, really uh, uh, inspiring to be here. I want to thank you all for tuning in. I know there have been some technical difficulties. That is just the reality of the Zoom world. Um, uh, I appreciate you sticking through us. And I also want to acknowledge all of the companies uh, uh, first responders. Uh, there are many throughout the company um, who are working hard at uh, keeping our power on, restoring it when it goes out, and dealing with conditions um, that uh, keep you away from your families when most of us are huddling together and, and uh, you know, concerned for our own well-being. So just want to know, uh, want you to know that we appreciate you uh, in that role. Uh, my name is Cyrus Bedwar. I serve as the Director of Energy Efficiency Policy for the Southeast Energy Efficiency Alliance. We are a regional, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization headquartered here in Atlanta. Uh, however, we serve 11 states, uh, starting up in Virginia, uh, going through uh, Kentucky, Arkansas, Louisiana, and looping back around the coast. Uh, or as another form of awesome mind put it, uh, we serve the area where you can get uh, sweet tea and grits in, in plentiful supply. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with many of the utilities in our region uh, to work collaboratively to bring more energy efficiency to the table. And uh, I'll be speaking a little bit more about how that uh, relates to uh, the social justice efforts we're talking about today. Thanks so much. Thanks, Cyrus. Angelou? Thank you. Um, I'd first like to also thank, thank the panelists um, that are here with me today. And I'd also like to thank Jeff and his team for putting this together and bringing us all here together to discuss these important issues. But I'd also like to thank Dr. Mark Berry. Um, Mark Berry has been an incredible supporter of the work that we do at the Green Youth Foundation and understands um, the importance of being able to provide this access to uh, disenfranchised and disfavored young people so that they too could understand the role that they can play in this environmental justice movement. Um, so my name is Angelou Ezilo. I um, am the founder and CEO of Green Youth Foundation. Our organization over the past 17 years has been focused on connecting underrepresented youth and young people to careers in the environmental sector. And we've done that through um, environmental education, that continuum that I believe Charmaine spoke of, environmental education, um, providing um, internship, paid internship opportunities for young people to work with our, part, our federal land management agency partners like the Park Service, Department of Energy, Fish and Wildlife, Forest Service, and so forth but also through our Urban Youth Corps program, um, which is a, a young a program that provides hard skills as well as soft skills to underrepresented young people in the Metro Atlanta area. We serve, um, our organization is based in Atlanta, um, but we serve the country of the US and we're also um, internationally, we have a presence in international um, countries as well, particularly in Africa, countries in Africa. Um, so looking forward to um, this discussion today so we can talk about some of these really critical issues that we all know need to be addressed immediately. Thank you. Thanks, Angelou. Uh, Chandra? Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you to Georgia Power for convening this, this conversation today. Uh, I'm super excited to be uh, a part of it. I am uh, 
the CEO of Resolve Consulting, which is a consulting practice with a mission to work with companies, community-based organizations, um, academia to increase the impact of their utility, energy, and climate initiatives with an equity-centered and justice-centered delivery infrastructure. So uh, really continuing the work um, that I did for the last um, four years as the Just Energy Director at Partnership for Southern Equity, where I focused on energy equity um, partnerships, where we focused on community organizing, uh, community leadership development, and coalition building, all related to making sure that the people who are most impacted um, by issues related to utility planning, uh, energy planning, and decision making are involved in and leading and have a voice in the full spectrum of energy planning and decision making. Um, so getting people involved um, at the Public Service Commission, uh, getting people involved in the demand side management working group um, that Jeff has led um, for so long for us and, and many partners. So I'm excited um, to talk about uh, the connection um, between equity and energy, the connection between justice um, and energy, and why that is so important um, to any um, social justice effort um, focused on lifting people out of poverty um, and advancing a more just and equitable clean energy future. Great, thanks, Chandra. And Nataki? Good, I guess it's afternoon now. So good afternoon and, and thank you so much, uh, Jeff um, and to Monique Carter for the invitation to be here today to speak um, with or alongside these very esteemed panelists today. Um, my name is Dr. Nataki Osborne-Jelks. I am co-founder of the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, uh, otherwise known as WAWA, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and we are a community-based organization that works on the west side of Atlanta, both northwest and southwest Atlanta, um, to really grow a, a cleaner, greener, healthier, and more sustainable west side. Um, and we do that work through uh, organizing, through participatory research and community science, uh, as well as education. Um, and we center environmental justice and issues of equity uh, in our work. And as we do that work, um, we find ourselves on the west side of Atlanta being overburdened uh, with a number of challenges uh, from exposure to environmental toxicants and stressors, uh, in some cases, lack of investment you know, in our infrastructure. Uh, and then we also uh, hold within our community uh, a number of the neighborhoods or zip codes that have some of the highest energy burden uh, in the city. Um, so these issues are very important to us. Um, in recent years, we have um, uh, sort of added a strategic focus on climate and equity issues uh, in which we're looking at issues around energy efficiency. Uh, we're looking at um, kind of this trifecta of insecurities that we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and then we're also looking at uh, people's uh, access to things like energy efficiency um, and you know, uh, renewable energy alternatives uh, in, in, in our communities. Um, so I'll just stop there, but thank you again for um, the invitation to be a part of this really important discussion. I'm so glad that uh, Georgia Power is having this discussion and um, was very excited to learn of all of the strategic initiatives um, that Georgia Power is engaging in in this space. Great. Thanks, Nataki. And last but not least, Colleen. Good. I guess afternoon. Thank you so much. I'll echo everybody's thanks for the invitation. I'm Colleen Kiernan. I'm the Senior Director for Government and Community Affairs at MARTA, which is the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority. Uh, I've been in this role for just about three years, and some of you may be familiar with my name. Most of my career was with the Sierra Club, um, so it's good to be with you again with this role, with this hat. Um, I'm not sure. And when um, Ronnie and Monique approached me to participate in this conversation, I was a little bit confused about what um, I would add to the conversation that my colleagues are going to bring to you today. And I think that, you know, as the utility industry is very quickly evolving, I think that we'll find that the transportation industry is um, becomes the most important area to address as far as climate change is concerned. And also, I think that um, there's a conversation to be had about transportation. 
founders of the um, Southern Company platform. So, I mean, I think that if you if you think about the resources that each of us has as human beings, we have time, money, and relationships. And so the access to, you know, our institutions, be it education, healthcare, shopping, visiting friends, worshiping, um, the access that we have is sort of underpins the level of equity that we're able to achieve. So um, I will try to fit what I say into the buckets before us in terms of energy equity, but I just wanted to call out at the beginning that I think that transportation equity and justice is perhaps an even bigger conversation. And I think that, you know, Georgia Power and MARTA, I think, have a lot to of potential really important partnerships to that we've already undertaken and that we can continue to pursue. So I look forward to this conversation. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So um, we'll go ahead and get started with our with our questions and the conversation. Um, Nataki, I want to come to you first. Could you give us a, a, a you know, talk a little bit about energy insecurity and in particular how are low income communities and com communities of color the most impacted by it? Sure, thank you for that question, Jeff. And I think you began to sort of talk about this in your comments earlier about energy burden and this percentage uh, that people um, would, pay, would pay of their um, you know, monthly income um, to go toward uh, energy costs. And so when we talk about energy insecurity, we're talking about the hardships that people experience, really just trying to meet basic needs, uh, inclusive of trying to pay for um, their household energy needs. Um, there is a ton of research and evidence that um, shows that communities of color, uh, low-income communities are some of the communities where people are spending a disproportionate amount uh, of their income uh, on energy cost. Um, it's not just, you know, energy, there are other utilities that can come in, in, into the mix, um, but energy is one of those that we're, we're definitely very uh, concerned about. Um, when we talk about energy uh, insecurity, um, it's also talked about um, in the context of this um, idea of the trifecta of insecurities. So we're talking about energy, we're talking about housing as well as food. And on the housing side, um, in, in some cases, you know, uh, what is connected to um, that high energy burden or paying a disproportionate amount for energy cost um, is living perhaps in an older housing stock um, that is energy inefficient. Um, and so again, as people are just trying to heat or cool their homes, you know, basic things that that we all need to do from time to time, um, you know, the, the lack of um, kind of upgraded, you know, housing or this housing that may be older, um, you know, puts, you know, some communities more at risk from a financial burden, um, but also from a health burden from a public health side of things. Um, and these same, you know, communities and same households, you know, as they are grappling with these issues around paying for their energy costs, uh, in some cases, you know, people are making trade-offs in terms of, you know, what they can even access in terms of food, um, you know, hence this whole trifecta of insecurities. Um, so I'll just kind of stop there. But, you know, as we talk about, you know, energy insecurity, um, I'm glad that you've lifted up already, you know, this idea of energy burden um, and this critical issue for low income and communities of color um, with respect to people um, just not, you know, being able to to always afford, um, you know, the, the cost um, associated, you know, with uh, something that is very basic and needed by everybody. Great. Well said, Nataki. Thank you. Um, Chandra, I'm going to come to you now. Uh, if you could, I, I know you, when you gave us a, an overview of you and your role now, uh, could you talk about a couple of concrete things that utilities can do to support racial equity and social justice as it pertains to energy justice? Absolutely. Um, and thanks to Nataki for, for that framing. I think there are uh, three things off the top. Um, give me one second. My computer is having a major fan issue, so I just needed to turn that off. Um, I think there are, are three things that utilities can do around, one, increasing investment in energy efficiency. And that's important from a transformational investment standpoint. Um, versus more of an incremental investment standpoint. Um, that's particularly important because we know that 
energy efficiency is, yes, can help us reduce energy burden by lowering utility bills, particularly when uh, we're investing in weatherization and energy efficiency, um, can reduce a household's bills around 25, you know, 20 to 25 percent based on what the what the measures are. Um, but also investing in energy efficiency can support stabilization of energy costs. Um, when we talk about these strategies around weatherization, energy efficiency, rooftop solar, um, particularly now paired with storage, um, and neighborhood sited community solar, uh, neighborhood sited microgrids. These are all um, opportunity, these are all investment opportunities and priorities um, for, for utilities. We know here, um, unfortunately, in the South, Southern states consistently rank at the bottom um, of lists for, for energy efficiency, and we consistently rank at the top of lists for energy burden. So we, we have some work to do on a flip there, and that is a primary strategy um, that utilities have um, direct control and opportunity um, to be able to increase investment in. Uh, number two, I will say related, um, is to leverage resources, operational and financial, um, to create partnerships and direct investment where gaps may exist in other um, related delivery around energy efficiency and weatherization. Um, for instance, partnerships um, with the weatherization agencies. Um, there's understand that there are partnerships around ensuring that um, through Georgia Power's Energy Assistance Program, around energy assistance related to emergency utility assistance. But what we want is to make sure that folks aren't consistently having to constantly come back for that same assistance over and over. Um, our partners at community action agencies and other support agencies and in community talk about well, we're seeing the same folks, you know, the, the same time. So what um, are utilities doing to increase um, investment, leverage those partnerships and resources of, you know, major operational and, and financial resources um, to streamline those delivery systems? So we are not um, just putting a Band-Aid on issues, but instituting um, reforms and streamlined strategies to move us forward um, in a progression um, to solve some of these issues, which is, is definitely in the power um, of utilities being able to direct investments and particularly in partnership with the folks on this call um, and, and many um, agencies. The third thing I will say utilities can do um, is partnering on being more transparent with data and access. Um, better understanding of who is and who isn't benefiting um, from various utility programming um, or other opportunities allows us, the collective us, the utility and community partners and state agencies to better prioritize resources and better direct investment um, to areas that are more energy burdened, um, areas that um, do house um, communities overburdened by environmental injustice, um, areas um, that need our recovery, whether, you know, we're still recovering from the economic um, recession due to COVID, um, but also natural disaster. So this really ties also back to um, the pillar and focus around just transition. Um, so those three things, increasing investment um, to transformational um, investment, not incremental investment levels around energy efficiency, leveraging resources, internal operations, and as well as financial in partnership and also um, partnering on that data, uh, that data access. Great, thanks Chandra. Cyrus, I'm coming to you next. Um, you and your organization do a, a ton of work in the energy efficiency space in Georgia and the surrounding uh, Southeast community. Can you, you talk a little bit about what you think the role in energy efficiency is towards achieving energy justice? Thanks, Jeff. Um, and I'm gonna, I'll say first, it's so heartwarming to hear, you know, quite diverse organizations voicing the same issues. It means I think we're making progress. We're starting to see things similarly. Uh, we don't need to see things the same way. Uh, we can do better work if we all have different approaches 
to addressing these issues. Uh, so I'm going to, I think, I think both Nataki and Chandra have, have touched on many points uh, that I would echo. Um, I will say also that I think the universe knew I was going to be on this panel uh, talking about this stuff. And so literally in the past few days, it's thrown me a few resources that I'm going to draw on first. And the, the first one I'll turn to is I heard on a webinar this Monday um, led, led by EPA Region 4. And the speaker was talking, the speaker was from the Environmental Justice uh, Office. Uh, within the regional office, and they were talking about the difference between equity and justice. And I think it's very powerful that the company has chosen energy justice as its its aligning title for this initiative. Uh, and the speaker said something along the lines of pursuing equity means closing the gaps that exist among segments of our population. Pursuing justice means addressing the reasons for those gaps in the first place. And I think that's relevant to our conversation today because it helps put different parts of the conversation in, in perspective. Um, so to me, I'm the director of energy efficiency policy and policy is more often than not the reason for differences in uh, services and opportunities for various parts of our population. I'll come to that, I'll come to that second. I think programming is the way in which we can immediately address some of the inequities that we see before us. Uh, and I'll kind of cast this in this in, in SIA's journey on this issue. So normally energy efficiency is has been for much of its life a pretty wonky issue. Um, it's not been sexy. We know that we can't compete with solar panels. Uh, even policymakers get more excited about uh, seeing uh, solar farms than they do about seeing a, a caught gun. Um, but it is we I have been working in this space for almost 20 years because I deeply believe it's important. Uh, so about 10 years ago, the federal government invested what we thought was a generational investment in energy efficiency through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And SIA took $25 million of that investment and worked with 16 communities around the region to set up energy efficiency programs uh, where a utility was not already offering such a service. Um, and as part of that, we were required to offer uh, financing. Everyone would thought that energy efficiency financing was going to be the silver bullet uh, because the way energy efficiency works is you make a upfront capital ex uh, expense in all the equipment, all the changes, uh, everything you need to do, uh, and then you recover the savings over time. So that's a bit of a mismatch. If you don't have the cash to invest up front, it's hard to get to those savings. So financing, it was thought, would get us uh, over that barrier. Um, as you can imagine, with a large federal program, there was a lot of reporting and analysis. And I, I remember the day a colleague uh, who is reviewing some of those reports and analysis walked into my office and said, you know, it looks like the financing programs that we offered reached people who didn't really need them. And conversely, it didn't reach the people who we thought could really benefit from them. And that was really the beginning of my organization's journey towards equity, moving to equity in Charmaine's words. Um, we would, uh, we would uh, continue uh, in various ways uh, exploring this topic and, and bringing it more closely integrated with energy efficiency in the work we do. And one of these one of those ways we're proud to say is manifest right now with Georgia Power. Uh, so while the sorts of financing we offered during uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act didn't work very well, there has been a much more promising model developed called pay as you save, which overcomes that barrier of putting out a large chunk of money and then not recovering it for years on end. And uh, I am thrilled to say that Georgia Power was the first investor owned utility uh, in the country to offer a pilot program that is currently operating in, in uh, energy burden neighborhoods in Atlanta and Athens based on this model. Um, so fast forward to 2020, um, it was a year of reckoning for all of us. Uh, we were first hit by the COVID pandemic, which threw many of us on our heels just because of the massive changes we had to make in our lives. Um, but I will remember very clearly the day I learned the news about Ahmed Arbery's killing. Um, I was just about to jump on a team meeting and um, I, had, I had literally just seen the headline and I was shaken and it showed up in the meeting and it led to organizational conversations about what, what that meant 
and later George Floyd and, and on and on, what that meant to our work and how we needed to reframe that. So we started looking at the intersection of racial injustice and energy efficiency. And we've come up with a framing we called energy and security. Um, our organizational view is that present day energy insecurity is rooted in historic racism and particularly policies around real estate and housing and finance. Um, so folks may be familiar with the concept of redlining in which certain areas of certain communities were outlined and they were not able to receive investment, get access to financial and other resources to improve their conditions. And those are the same areas that we see when we do analysis on energy burden that are facing the highest energy burdens. Um, and this this seems like a, a distant issue. I mean, it, it's not it's not likely that anybody right now kind of thinks about redlining. But literally, as I mentioned earlier, the universe needed uh, was offering me some resources to prepare for this conversation. And today there was an article on redlining and how these covenants still exist on the books, even though they are both illegal and no longer enforced. Um, and there's a story, if you look on NPR today, that you can find about this issue that really brings home how these things continue to exist in our lives. Um, and so going back to the difference between equity and justice, energy efficiency is a way of starting to remedy these inequities by investing in homes, investing in improving their condition, the indoor air quality, reducing the energy bills, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we can start to close the gap of these uh, uh, differences in different parts of our population. From a justice point of view, um, you know, that took me a minute to think about uh, what are the policies that may be embedded in our energy systems that may, we may not be fully aware of that contribute to these continuing inequities. Um, and one thing that we have observed, we have learned by being invited into conversations is that there are um, the public service commissions that regulate companies like Georgia Power are often required to make decisions based on economic efficiency. What these uh, decisions don't always take into account are issues of equity um, and increasingly uh, common issues of climate. Um, and so when you look at, when you zoom out and you look at what are the reasons for the conditions that we find ourselves in, um, you know, uh, there are a number of efforts exploring what it would mean to integrate climate and equity into the regulatory mandate that governs these bodies uh, and leads to uh, decisions that impact companies like Georgia Power. So I'll stop there. Great. Great. Thanks, Cyrus. So, Angelou, I'm coming to you now. Um, if you could, could you uh, talk to us a little bit around what what does the future of clean energy jobs look like as we talk about, you know, a, a lot of these opportunities and, and work that needs to be done, there, there needs to be a workforce to do it. So from your perspective, could you share that with us? Sure, sure. The, the future is, is very bright and, and I think for, for clean energy jobs, I mean, when you look at the, the rate and pace of change happening in the world, it's totally exponential. And, you know, it's really important for us to see that in order for us to, to keep up with that pace, we need to start viewing the types of jobs that we're going to be having differently. They're not going to be the ones of the past. So when you look at the jobs of the future, you're looking at energy efficiency. You're looking at clean vehicles, renewable energy. Um, and then that brings in wind turbines and solar turbines and so forth. And I think one of the issues is, and, and I, I so appreciated your com all of your comments, but Cyrus, you talked about the importance of intersectionality, you know, and that we really can't even talk about energy, energy justice, environmental justice without thinking about racial justice and, you know, the impact that it's had on certain communities. So to the goal of achieving equity in both social and economic um, participation in the energy system, we have to look at who is at the table, who has a voice, you know, so that um, these issues won't keep occurring over and over again, you know, and us kind of wondering why do we keep getting to this point? A, a large part of it is making sure that the jobs that are there, that are the jobs of the future, there's some jobs that are gonna be 
happening. Our future jobs for our youth haven't even been invented yet. You know, so that's how quickly this stuff is happening. But we need to make sure that people of color, diverse communities, those communities that have been disenfranchised are at the table. And that's kind of what's critical for us at Green Youth Foundation is making sure these young people that typically don't have a voice or a seat at the table are aware of these opportunities and are aware of these jobs and are aware that they can be these change makers that we need in place so that they can be responsive to some of these uh, critical issues that are plaguing society. So um, my answer to your question of what does the future look like? I think if we all can put on this, um, we need multiple perspectives and stakeholders and voices at the table. And if we can all put on this new hat, if you will, that that because I think COVID has shown us that the way we work, the way we communicate, the way we shop, you know, our form of money, everything is changing rapidly. So we really have to like stop thinking about things the way of the past and 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 really look forward to the future. And that future has to include young people from different walks of life. That's the only way that we're going to be able to move this forward and not wind up in the same place that we are today in the future. Great. Thanks so much, Angela. Colleen, um, so from uh, with Marta, I know transportation is key to, to everything that, that you do. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you see transportation impacting the economy and the social mobility and how it pertains to, to this topic today around energy justice? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, and uh, I'll go back a little bit and reference what Cyrus was talking about, about redlining, you know, and I think also Angela was also talking about the intersectionality of this all, but, you know, land use, energy, and transportation are inextricably linked together, and you can't solve one without addressing the other two. So, um, I, like, I also, as we've been talking, we're, was thinking about, you know, the earliest days of Atlanta's transportation system was our streetcar system that was built by Georgia Power. And it fundamentally offered equity for young people, old people, you know, people with disabilities, people, um, you know, everyone could ride the streetcar. And as, you know, that was dismantled in favor of, of the, you know, roadway based system that we are most the construction of many of those facilities, you know, the Canada, for example, you know, really cut apart communities and is sort of a historic injustice that we can now seek to address through better land use, um, energy and transportation policies. I also um, wanted to, as we've been talking, I was thinking about you know, the access that I was talking about in the introduction to jobs, education, health care, you know, housing, affordable housing, you know, all of these things contribute to what we are as a culture and a society. And I just wanted to share this story. Um, you know, Marta provides transportation service in Fulton, DeKalb, Clayton County, and the city of Atlanta. And in the pandemic, we were faced with a difficult choice to suspend. We have right now 110 bus routes, but we suspended 70 of them in order to run more buses on fewer routes so that people could social distance and we weren't, you know, moving folks around in a, you know, incubator of disease. Um, but one of the most surprising reactions that I got was a call from the mayor of Sandy Springs, Rusty Paul, who was calling about a bus route 74 that serves Southwest DeKalb County. And I was like, why is Rusty Paul asking about 74? And it turns out that there's this cake shop in Roswell that, you know, their employees relied on the 74 and the cake shop was having, to, you know, the employees weren't able to get to work and the cake shop was struggling as a result. And so it just sort of really hit home to me, you know, throughout our region, how much we really are linked and how an impact, you know, in one area of the region, you know, can cascade through and have effects in other places. And so I think that um, in addition to the inequities that we've created with transportation, it is also an integral part of the solution towards a more just and economic, um, equitably equitable future. Great. Not, I don't fit in the box, but. 
And some, sometimes so you got. I'm doing my best. <laughs> yeah, no, you're you're doing awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think one thing that's you know becoming very obvious as we, as we talk through this is it's it's a big issue, right? And a big issue needs multiple um, points to help find solutions. And so, Cyrus, I want to come back to you uh, if if you don't mind. And from your perspective, talk about partnerships. I mean, as we think through how do we move towards um, elimin- or just to providing energy justice and eliminating some of the barriers that are there. What sort of partnerships do you see uh, that, that are important in helping to address energy justice in, in our territory? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, so uh, there, I, I, I stand corrected. I said energy efficiency is probably the one of the least sexy uh, elements of, of the work we do. Uh, I'm reminded uh, yesterday, Jeff and I were at a conference together and uh, we had a speaker on a subset of energy efficiency called demand response, which is is, is possibly uh, even drier and less interesting. Um, but the speaker said something uh, quite uh, remarkable at the end of her, her remarks. And she said, you know, uh, I can't remember what the question was, but her response is, I like to think of the utility as a community you know, as a platform for bringing people together. And so um, I'm still processing that comment and think about what it means to me. Uh, but I'll offer that because I think it's relevant to to the question you posed, Jeff. Um, in our work, uh, we are very excited about um, uh, um, integrating two different sectors into the work that we do. Um, uh, one is housing. Um, And I think I explained and others have touched on the reason uh, that uh, partnering with the housing sector is so important to addressing the inequities uh, and perhaps to some degree the injustice uh, of the situations that we face right now. Um, So just quickly, because of that historic racist policy, uh, there has been disinvestment in certain communities. You simply don't have the funds to improve your building and therefore it falls into disrepair uh, and it needs fixing. Um, uh, And and secondly, something I've come to realize in in my line of work is that nobody owns the home. When you think about it, when you have a car, you have a variety of very distinct service providers to get the things you need. You have a gas station or soon to be a charging station. Uh, You have a mechanic, you have a car wash. You have the auto parts store. It's very clear where you go for what things for your car. When it comes to the house, it is not at all clear. You can go into Home Depot, you can go into a hardware store, but unless you're an expert, you know, you often have to look at 17 YouTube videos to figure out what you need, what you need to do. So nobody owns the home. And we've been we've been in conversation with many of our utilities uh, about that question. And I was talking to a co-op from Alabama yesterday who in addition to doing energy efficiency audits is now doing because they offer because they're a co-op they can offer broadband they're also doing technology audits for their customers they're looking at the technologies that are or are not in the home and these are often for homes and homeowners who have never had good internet access so they don't they can't even imagine the different things you can do with good internet so they're integrating that and they're trying to be a trusted partner a good source of information about the different benefits and improvements in quality of life that their customers can achieve through kind of evaluating the different options and making making sound decisions um, uh, because nobody owns the home, there are there's a patchwork quilt of housing service agencies. They're often very hyper local, um, uh, and they they do uh, urgent repairs and rehabilitation. So we've started to engage with these partners for lack of other options, and we're trying to understand how they work. Uh, they will often be the ones that can address the conditions that we and utilities find most perplexing, which is those homes which are in such disrepair that they can't even accept weatherization. They can't accept uh, energy efficiency because there's a hole in the roof or there's mold and mildew um, or there's a health and safety condition that uh, tightening the house will only make worse. Um, But utilities are not authorized to spend on those things, right? Um, So this pre-weatherization, these agencies are starting to understand the role they play in improving customers' lives more holistically, uh, but they need resources, they need expertise, they need training. 
And so we think that through these partnerships with utilities and these housing service agencies, uh, we can start to move the needle. Um, and I'm really pleased to say um, that for the first time, uh, so I live uh, on the east side of Atlanta and I have joined the board of uh, what's called the Martin Luther King Service Project, which works to keep uh, low-income seniors in their homes in the city of Decatur by making these urgent repairs. Um, and we are so thrilled that for the first time, Georgia Power has come on as a sponsor of that project, which we'll be doing over MLK weekend uh, in 2022. Um, the second, and I'll be quick on this, is healthcare. Healthcare, uh, why? Well, I think I think it was Nataki, but may have others uh, others may have uh, pointed out the health impacts that come with um, uh, uh, disinvested housing, with unhealthy housing, um, mold, mildew, uh, the the simple inability to keep the temperature at a healthy level. Uh, too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter. That can exacerbate a lot of pre-existing conditions. Right now, many of the uh, customers that find themselves in an energy burdened uh, position may also be uninsured. And so when an asthma attack happens, they will go to the emergency room and we will all pay for that. Um, an emergency room visit, I am told, is $2,500. A hospitalization for an asthma attack can reach up to $20,000. Now, Jeff knows how much you can do to a home for twenty thousand um, dollars. It is a lot. So if we can start to shift those dollars away from the post intervention and into a pre intervention through energy efficiency, through weatherization, through holistic, healthy housing uh, uh, interventions, uh, I think we can do a lot for a lot less. Um, and so we're excited to explore partnership with healthcare providers, insurers and others uh, to realize this. And I'll stop there. Great, thanks, Cyrus. And I know, you know Georgia Power is excited to, to potentially work with y'all on a pilot around the intersection of, of energy efficiency and health. Uh, and so, again, something that's that's important to us, and we're looking forward to seeing if we can prove that out. Um, Chandra, heads up, I'm getting ready to come to you, but there's a question, uh, Cyrus. I wanted to give you a, an opportunity to track it down. Uh, we've got some folks asking if you could provide the title of the NPR article on redlining that you referenced earlier, um, and that way we can uh, to share that with folks. I will be happy to do that. I'll say it aloud right now, and, and then I'll drop uh, resources uh, in the chat to Monique, and, and she can share them. So it's called Racial Covenants, A Relic of the Past, Are Still on the Books Across the Country. Uh, so I'll send the title and the link. Um, yeah. Please do, because otherwise we better have some fast riders out there. <laughs> sure. So, so Chandra, um, if you, when it talk when we talk about energy efficiency and when we talk about energy justice in particular, um, in the energy utility decision, in as it pertains to energy and utility decision, why is it important for racial equity and social justice to be uh, discussed in that? like we may have lost Chandra. Um, so while we're waiting on Chandra to come back and I will reapproach that question. Colleen, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about MARTA and zero emissions and the transportation options that 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 you have and how that can help both from an environmental and from an energy justice um, perspective in the in the territories that y'all serve. Sure. Thank you. So as you probably know, um, since 1979, MARTA has been running the combined bus and rail system in Atlanta. And so our heavy rail system that spans from North Fulton to the airport and West Atlanta to um, East DeKalb um, does runs on electricity. And I think at various times we are perhaps Georgia Power's largest partner. So we already have that going for us. And our heavy rail trains can move more people, really, you know, can move hundreds of thousands of people a day. Um, and there's the capacity to do more. The two things that I wanted to share that are on the horizon and that we're continuing to work on is that we have been adding electric charging. So we have them now at six of our rail stations, as well as at the Windward Parkway Park and Ride, as well as at our Laredo bus facility. And so I ride by the Candler Park Edgewood station frequently and all of those it is not unusual to see all of those charging stations being utilized. So it um, really heartens me that people are um, 
doing a clean commute. They're taking their electric vehicle to the Georgia Power charging station at the train station and getting on the electric train. The future thing that will be um, on the streets at some point in 2022 is the first six electric buses will be rolling. And that's a partnership between MARTA, Georgia Power, uh, Center for Transportation Excellence, CTE, um, that's funded in part by the Federal Transit Administration. And it is our hope that with events of this week with the authorization that there will be a great deal of additional support for more of that. So i um, delighted to have those three partnerships and I think that we can continue to do more together. Great, thank you. Um, Angelou, I have a, a question for you and then Nataki, I'll, I'll come to you next. Uh, so, Angelou, if you could talk about why is it essential to have a diverse workforce in the environmental sector and in uh, the different areas of work that we talked about from that, that will be growing in this space in the near future? Sure. I mean, um, it's just really critical to represent. Representation is very critical um, in every area now, you know, but one of the things that we've seen in the environmental sector is that it's been extremely um, uh, homogeneous and representation has not been there. Um, Dr. Dorsetta Taylor has a green 2.0 report that shows that, you know, within federal agencies and environmental NGOs and so forth, there's just like 14% of diversity um, at these top organizations in the environmental sector. And our belief, and I think a lot of people, particularly on this panel, can make that connection that if you don't have people from various backgrounds and communities of color in these roles within these environmental sectors and organizations, then there's no representation. And then that kind of leads to this lack of equity in these different areas. So um, it, there's a direct connection um, to diversity in the workforce as it relates to equity and um, making sure that young people understand the role that they could play and that the fact that we need them in this environmental sector is very critical right now, especially as we have a changing demographic in society we have all these issues that we are plagued with. You know, we're talking about energy burden and, you know, um, resiliency, climate, all these different things are impacting these disenfranchised and disfavored communities the most. The most impact is coming to these communities. So it's very important to have representation from these communities that are working and have a voice and our advocates for um, the rights of the communities, but also working in these spaces so that they can effectuate change. Very good, thank you. And Nataki, I'm gonna apologize in advance. I'm about to throw a long question at you. Um, so, you know, what are some solutions that can help bring about energy justice and reduce energy insecurities in communities? And then Part two of that question is based on some is based on some questions we're getting from some folks on the call is in particular, how do we focus around rental properties where um, property owners may be focused uh, on renting their space more so than ensuring that the tenants have um, affordable energy bills. So if I need to repeat any of that, I'm more than happy to, uh, but I'd love to get your insight on that. So I'll, I'll start some of the other experts weigh in on this as well. Um, but I guess to your first piece about kind of energy justice, I, I think there have actually been a number of things that have already been said that can come together to be part of that that answer or part of that solution. So, you know, as we think about, you know, justice, energy justice, um, you know, we're thinking, you know, obviously about um, really just ensuring that um, that people, you know, have access to the resources that they, that they need um, to live, you know, healthy lives. And so as we think about that, we're thinking about that in the context of 
um, the energy burden, the energy insecurity that certain uh, households and you know populations face, and how do we erase that? You know, how do we eliminate that? How do we maybe taking kind of what Cyrus was talking about first begin to <clears throat> excuse me close those gaps in? And so some of what's been suggested already in terms of the investments in energy efficiency programs, um, really looking at how we get beyond the pilot stage, you know, for some of those, um, I think is really important when we look at, you know, the numbers around, you know, how many people are burdened, how many people are impacted. Um, you know, let's let's run the pilot programs, let's tweak them and then figure out how um, these things get a chance to be, you know, implemented on on a much broader scale. Um, Chandra mentioned earlier, um, you know, the work that she has engaged in around, um, you know, the PSC um, and making sure that, you know, people know that there is a public service commission that is making, you know, decisions um, about, you know, things like, you know, the rates that we pay uh, for our energy costs. And so how do we make sure uh, that people have greater access um, to these decision making tables, one that they know that it exists and that they have a way to influence that um, based on their ability to share the impacts um, that folks are experiencing. So, you know, this just this notion that communities um, should have a say so and should have agency in shaping uh, their own energy futures is really important. Making sure that those voices are heard around, you know, energy efficiency, you know, as that starting point or that low hanging fruit, but then to a broader suite of uh, renewable energy alternatives that we can all tap into. So as we talk about kind of trying to achieve that energy justice, you know, it's it's about putting all of these things into place. And it's about, you know, ensuring um, that communities that are already overburdened um, and disadvantaged uh, from a number of different perspectives, um, you know, folks who are living in these historically red line, you know, neighborhoods and, and otherwise, uh, making sure that, you um, you know, we don't continue to have these situations where those who are least able to pay are severely overburdened, um, you know, with uh, with the cost for, um, you know, paying for for energy. Um, so that really, you know, gets to focusing on some of these root problems uh, and, and challenges and, you know, looking at um, the resources that people have access to in the communities in which they live is really important. And so as you talked about the the um, I guess the question about renters, I don't know that I have the answer to this, but um, I'm going to. Just bring up maybe a model um, of something that is happening, um, you know, still in the utility space, but kind of on the water side. Um, and there probably are a lot of other, you know, things that I'm not thinking about um, that folks, especially who work on this on the policy side on a day to day basis will have a much better answer for. But as we are thinking about um, and piloting things that could work, uh, one program that I'm aware of um, that is, you know, it's not a fix all, um, but it's something in the um, the water space um, that the city of Atlanta has actually implemented is something called care and conserve. And so there um, where there are households that, you know, have high water bills um, that might connect to the infrastructure in people's homes and to, you know, leaky toilets or faucets or, you know, whatever it is that's driving up the cost um, of, of water. Uh, for people, um, the city has has worked and ha they've worked through nonprofit organizations like uh, Integrity CDC um, and South Face and, and perhaps others um, to do some sort of diagnosis of these homes um, and to provide some assistance to people to um, repair what is what's what's leaking and what needs to be fixed to try to reduce um, the cost that people, you know, are paying for the water. And just because you live in a home uh, as a renter, you are not um, um, you're not uh, ineligible for this program as long as the homeowner, um, you know, um, agrees to have the repairs done at no cost, you know, to to them. So that's um, maybe one example. I'm sure there's a lot in terms of the weatherization, you know, kind of weatherization uh, and energy efficiency programs that would also kind of fit the bill for that, um, that perhaps, you know, don't need to have, um, you know, as long as the homeowner is, is 
uh, amenable to it, uh, then people, you know, then we can get the help to those who need it. So I'll stop there because others may, you know, have better um, ideas or solutions. And you know, Taki, I think that gives us a, a a great example to think through and think beyond, you know, whatever that utility source is and a model that that may work, you know, for that space. So thank you for that. Chandra, I want to come back to you, and, and I think this will probably be our last question unless there's any more that comes through from the audience. Um, but and I'll, I'll try to ask my question a, a little clearer this time. Um, so why is utility decision making a racial equity and social justice issue? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, I think something that's really interesting that I've learned recently as someone who's been grounded in um, engaging with communities and partnering with communities to increase their civic engagement muscle, right? I mean, whether it's in front of the Public Utility Commission, whether it's at the State House, we're in the middle of municipal elections in Georgia, no matter where it is, whether it's running for the boards of electric membership cooperatives, that the core of this work um, is about people and about engagement. Equity is about people. Justice is about people. Uh, and something that I learned around public participation is that the UN actually, in their definition of poverty, includes a lack of access to decision making as an indicator of poverty. And when we link those things where people are not engaged and active in the full spectrum of decision making um, related to energy, um, related to utilities or related to housing, the talkies lifted up. Um, Dr. Diana Hernandez talks about the trifecta of, of insecurity, food, housing, and, and energy. When we don't have people engaged um, who are being disproportionately impacted, negatively impacted directly or indirectly, um, then that, that is why um, that, that is so important. So when we continue to ask ourselves, uh, why are we still talking about energy burden? Uh, why are we still talking about um, issues around lack of penetration around, uh, you know, weatherization after 30 years? Why can we point to not just the problem, but also the direct um, root um, uh, of, of the problem? We talked a lot about redlining, which is directly related to housing disinvestment and and failing infrastructure. Um, when we don't have the people who are experiencing um, those impacts, when we don't have the people who whose lived experience um, is around having to every single day um, fight these overlapping issues, then we're not creating solutions um, that are directly going to support people who are experiencing those issues. So then what we see is a, a Band-Aid um, situation uh, versus grabbing an issue at the root and creating uh, the systems transformation that is necessary um, to move each other um, out of these oppressive, uh, oppressive systems um, and the disproportionate and inequitable impacts of these systems. So that is um, a long way around of, of talking about the critical importance of people to be engaged um, in, these, in these processes um, at the Public Service Commission, at their utility commissions, at their electric membership cooperative boards, um, at, at city council where cities are talking about 100% uh, clean energy commitments um, or the transformative investments that we're all expecting to to flow from from to states from from the federal government. Um, we will never move forward um, on addressing and tackling these issues if we don't have the people um, who are most impacted, not just at the table, but maybe creating their own tables and their own conversations because the people closest to the problem are the people with the best solutions. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I think we've had all of the questions uh, answered that have come through from from our audience. Uh, again, I thank you all so much, panel, for your time and your expertise and your helping uh, us understand in more detail what energy justice are, what some of the issues around it are, and, and more importantly, what some of the potential solutions are. Um, very much appreciated. I hope from from the audience's perspective, we've learned more and and learned um, some 
opportunities to maybe reach out and help uh, solve some of these issues with our friends and neighbors uh, and customers. And Monique, I'm going to kick it back over to you to talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming opportunity. Thanks, Jeff. And thank you to our very esteemed panelists for this great discussion on energy justice. And thank you for attending our fifth webinar in a series of six social justice webinars. You will receive a brief survey of five questions that will take less than two minutes to complete. Your feedback is important and will be considered for future webinars. The final webinar will be held on tomorrow and the conversation will focus on mentoring and will feature Rita Breen, Charitable, Charitable Giving Executive Director, along with a panel of community leaders. You don't want to miss it. We'll see you tomorrow.